everybody has their own way. Like I've I've known people who who just you know they just cheat every game. They just like play with Stockfish every single game, and they're like, well, I mean, I, yeah, I'm cheating, but like I'm you know I'm using Stockfish to learn its patterns, and I'm getting better. It's like the whole like Indonesia scandal, basically. Mm -hmm. But oh yeah, yeah, I was gonna, actually going to bring that up because that was uh, when we were talking yeah, about like the internet or... and yeah, yeah, when when you. That was a when you rightfully said uh, easy month uh, of time dude. that was wow and you were getting like death threats from Indonesian people yeah, but right they, they were like, never going to fly over here <laughs>Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the C Squared podcast. Uh, yet another legend in house here with us. We are actually in LA and we have Gotham Chess, Levy Rossman, International Master Levy Rossman, with us. Levy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. Do you prefer Levy or Gotham Chess nowadays? No, no, please. What? I prefer Levy. Actually, funny <laughs> story. I showed up in the media entrance for the chess boxing event and I was late. Every, I just flew in today. Everybody was already there. And I said, I'm here for the chess boxing. My name is Levy Rosman. And he's like, okay. Who's Levy Rosman? Yeah, and uh, I had to pull up, and my name tag says Gotham Chess on it. Like, I can show the camera. It literally says Gotham Chess instead of my legal name. And guy had no clue who I was. I had to, like, pull out my phone and show him, you know. Um, so hey. I, I get called, uh, yeah, I get called everything, but yeah, Levy's fine. It. Google me. That's, that's, that's good enough. Yeah. I've also thought about telling a police officer that, like, if I don't have my ID <laughs> one day, like if I just left my wallet at home and I'm driving and I have to say like, oh, should, like should I tell him to Google me? Like, so there's Barkley. a risk that, that they take that personally and they're like, no, fuck you. Yeah. I don't care yeah. about who, whoever you are. And <laughs> yeah, like you have to have your ID. Yeah. You have a, to be polite about it. Right. Like officer, look, I don't have my ID with me. Just. Yeah. Google me and you will see that this is who I am. Like, trust me, yeah, you know, type of thing. Like, see it. you're not an asshole. And, and I think you're going to be fine about that. Yeah, well, we're in LA. We're uh, ready for a chess boxing event. That's uh, very exciting. I mean, I've seen you tease it a little bit on yeah, your social media as well. You, you enjoy boxing? Yeah, I got messaged by Ludwig back in June. I feel bad for you because I've told this exact story in Toronto, so I will keep it to like 30, yeah. 40 seconds. But I, I, uh, he messaged me and asked if I would be interested in fighting as the main event. And the problem was there was no opponent that matched all three criteria, like for me personally, to start this whole journey and risk injury and God knows what else. So they have to be as good as me in, in chess. Mm -hmm. They have to like also start from zero in boxing. And they have to, like, and I didn't want to go up against someone who wouldn't be fun to promote with. Like, I didn't want to carry the promotion myself. And literally the only person that checks all three boxes is Eric Rosen. Mm. We're kind of the same size. We're yeah. kind of the same, you know, strength in chess. And we have, like, both, you know, good followings. Uh, but, but despite that, even, like, Andrea and Dina yeah. are very mismatched chess-wise. Yes. Uh, so you could play someone who is either a little bit below or even... Uh, quite a bit below or quite a bit above your chess level? Yeah, so I, I would be happy to, like if the boxing started at zero and we were like around the same size to begin with, if there was like a grandmaster that was, you know, 150 to 160 pounds or I, don't, I, I can't gain like 10 or 15 pounds. Like I've, I've been at that weight and that was, I felt awful and I got sick, so I probably can't gain any weight. Yeah, I would do that because I think we're really underestimating how much the boxing is going to destroy your chess ability. Like after two mm. minutes of a sparring round. Yeah. It, you might just be a different person, a different chess player when, yeah, when you there, sit down at the board. I, tomorrow is going to be insane. Or whenever this airs, December 11th is going to be crazy. Like I, the chess quality I think is going to plummet. It's going to be really interesting to watch. And you're actually here as a uh, commentator. How did that come about? And what is your general experience as commentator? You've done this for chess.com, yeah. but obviously you do it in a more informal way on your Twitch channel, yeah. YouTube, and so on. So this came about because I realized like the fight with Eric probably wasn't going to happen. And I was kind of in a in an odd roundabout way, kind of offered Amon and Lawrence, but they're much bigger than me. I mean, they're fighting like 30 pounds above. It just, I mean... It just didn't seem like a fun idea to fight a much bigger guy who's also probably better than me at chess. And they they both also have like better nervous systems. I'm just realizing this about myself. Like I'm a nervous dude. Like I it would with, with stuff like this because I just don't know. There's so many variables. I like to be in my own domain of things that I'm good at. Like I know I'm good at for sure. And if I'm not that good at, I don't risk brain injury. Mm. I'll risk something, but just not brain injury. Uh, and the my, the problem was the commentary slot was gonna be Magnus. That was the original idea. 
which I was very okay being, you know, second fiddle, but Magnus didn't want to fly like 12 mm. hours here. And I don't blame him because I flew six today and I feel terrible. <laughs> so yeah, flying in like a day or two before and then doing the whole chess boxing, the, the you know, jet lag, uh, I, I think, I don't know. It just, it, it seems kind of crazy for him to do. So that's why I'm here. I mean, I mean, you say that you're not good or you don't like doing things that you're not experienced at, but when you first started chess content creation, mm -hmm. it, it was a totally new thing for you. You, you couldn't have known necessarily that you would have been amazing at it or that it would have been super successful. Yeah, I, and, and actually I, I realized like the last part of your question was, you know, chess commentary experience. I realized in, in Toronto in the global championship that it's a completely different experience doing live commentary, like esports feel, huge production. Like I came alive and I got energized. When I do the speech chess championship at home in my chair, I'm falling asleep half the match, not because the chess is bad. Yeah. It's just, it's just monitors and me and, you know, Nerditsky on the other, and like I see him getting tired, I'm tired. Like I'm just like, ah, oh, I gotta like sue. But in there, like live, it was a totally different feel. Um, and when I started the content creation, yeah, I don't know. It, it's been like a, a super weird journey because I started on Twitch so I could just be myself, play Blitz, like, you know, play copyrighted music back when it was allowed. Uh, and then I just started doing one YouTube video at a time and I, I kind of got better and better at, at certain elements of it, but I had a really big head start, I think, which was, I, I was a teacher for kids. And I think when you have to, you know, convince 10, six year olds to like, listen to you for an hour, like that takes some sort of, you know, you, you got to kind of become more animated, you know, kind of a little bit of a different person. And so what I just, would you say those attributes are in general? Like mine for concept? Yeah, yours, like, yours specifically um, that actually helped you grow and establish yourself. Yeah, I think, it, I, I think a lot of that is your voice. Yeah. I think you're, you're, the, way you, the way you talk and like enunciate and, and go back and forth and like your, your punchline and your timing for jokes or just for instruction, like you can kind of keep people hooked like in an auditory way mm -hmm. the whole time, um, which helps with things like TikTok as well. As much as short form content has a bad reputation, I'm sort of realizing that's how my brain works. I can just sort of get into the head of the person that's listening to me, which I just like to say that, I don't know, God or whoever gave us all some skills and I, that just happens to be mine. Like I can kind of understand what the other person wants to hear and or, or see specifically for chess. I can't, I'm not gonna go, I'm sure you guys on your Instagram to get all sorts of reels of instructional motivational stuff. I can't do that stuff. But I can do it for chess. That's what I'm realizing. Was that more a? Do you think it's more of a innate thing, or something that you also had to train a lot to hone your skill? No, I, it was completely innate. Like I'll be totally honest. I mean, I, for me, I I can hit record, and I can I have no script ever. I mean, I can sort of. It's kind of the way Joe Rogan is king of podcasting, and you guys are you know kings of chess podcasting <laughs> right now. So uh, I never. I, I would fine tune a few things and I'm, I'm pretty obsessive with it also. Like I, there, there's a lot of things that people don't realize when you just have the videos out, it's like, oh, okay, it's a video. Just like hours of rewatching your own footage. Like I would watch hours of my own live commentary mm. back, not because I'm a narcissist, but because I'd go, I didn't like how I handled this key moment. I like talked over my co-commentator during some hype moment and I notice everything. Like it's completely unnoticeable to the audience. So yeah, I think the obsessive element of it probably helps. Uh, but I don't know how healthy it is, but I never, I never took any like lessons or, or watched anything. I just, I guess I just am good at talking specifically about chess. I, I noticed, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I noticed that when you and Donnie were doing commentary for it, because I was watching the, I was also doing the commentary, mm -hmm. but I was really watching it because I was interested also from a point, point of view of like what makes a good commentator, right? And the style that you and Donia had was totally different or you yeah. and Amon as well from the classical chess commentary. It was very much a back and forth. It yeah. was like a conversation while usually it's, you know, they're discuss a position. This was, this was almost like, it really flowed. Yeah. And I mean, I, I was very impressed. I, I don't know if I can emulate that at all, but uh, it felt very much like you needed to, to have the training and the, the experience in the content creation right. to do that rather than, you know, it used to be, oh, these guys are good chess players, let's just have them talk mm -hmm. and they'll create something great. I, I don't know where that came from with Danya and myself. Like, I'll, I'll be totally honest. Uh, it could be because we're a bit, you know, we're, we're friendly kind of off camera, but I feel like Naradissi's kind of guy, like, you know, he could be friends with anybody. Like, there's just some, you know, some folks that don't mind, you know, just kind of like re recreational small talk. And like, I get tired when I need to think of things to say. 
And I think I've realized the last two, three years, like it just has to go. And that's when I get the most energized. Like sometimes I'm exhausted. I record a 30 minute video. Now I'm hyped. It doesn't make any sense. Like I just did a bunch of research for the video and I made the video. Now I have more energy than like, how does that happen? So that always made me think I was extroverted, but I'm definitely not because I just want to be by myself or like with my wife or, you know, in like small settings um, and certain traditionally extroverted situations would definitely tire me out. I don't know where that came from with Naraditsky, but I will say like, you know, there, there's pros and cons. Like when I watch like you and Hess, it's just very relaxed, like good, also good back and forth. You don't sound like, you know, you just both, uh, you know, snorted Adderall and got into the commentary. <laughs> booth. Like, but it's completely fine. I mean, people love it. There's no, um, maybe I feel the same way. It's like you get into it. Maybe it's like that concept of flow where maybe once you get into the groove of things, it just comes very naturally. Well, you don't have the apprehension that you have at the start. Yeah. And the thing is, I don't know what, like, I don't know what the benefit is of, of either. So if you, if you had an hour of footage of you and Hess, right. And you had an hour of footage of myself and Naraditsky, how do you determine which of those two is better? Like, which of those two would you, like, if you would have it for all the shows, for which one would you rather have it? Is that, do you take a hundred thousand brand new viewers and give it to them? I, th I think you have to, yeah, you're, you're gauging because there's no objective way to do it. You're gauging purely on audience reaction. Yeah. And tr like people who are already into chess, they love Robert. They mm -hmm. love seeing you in the commentary booth and you guys are like fantastic regardless. It, it's just a matter of if I'm brand new to chess and I saw you guys versus, you know, oh my God, back and forth. Like, I, you know, I, I don't know which one is, is technically correct. All, all I know is like when I get into the zone with Naraditsky, none of it is fake, which is fascinating. Like I'm not in there like, oh my God, he's going to finish talking. You know, right. I got to say something right. like, no, it's just like back and forth and it's, you know, it's good banter. I'm not sure I would be able to. But there's you, you need you need a co-host who's capable of that. I think Robert is also like very much a like a you could put him with a yeah, rock. Very easy. Like yeah. commentary yeah. will be yeah, yeah. fun anyway. No, so. I love commentating with Robert. He's uh, you, you you just feel that experience. Yeah. Like he knows when to hand it over to you. He knows when he needs to take the yeah. take the reins, and it's it's great to have that guy next to you that, in case you're feeling a little bit you know uneasy or or out of energy, mm -hmm. then he he'll take the or she will take the uh, take the wheel. Did you feel in Toronto like you had more energy? Because it was all like live, bright lights. Did you feel like, oh my, this is not, you know, doing commentary from my house, you know? Yeah, it, the first time it, I was so nervous the first day. Were I was you? super nervous. Because really? well. it was so different from the World Championship last year. Like yeah, just yeah. the gravity of it. Yeah. The amount of cameras and people and personnel and, uh, and having someone in my ear, which we, like we didn't get instructions yeah. or anything, but just having someone who's, Get, telling you like this scene is coming up so we're taking a break or whatever that was all new but then once I got into it I was like I felt very energized yeah I, I felt really good about it was there a public in Toronto did no. you guys have a public or no, just no. the production people no there was no room for a public uh, and and I realized this kind of the day before the reason why this happened is I think they, they, they just had a deal with the hotel essentially somehow through some you know some sort of one of their sponsors to organize it there and promote the hotel and whatnot. And the hotel is spectacular, but you cannot have a, a chess tournament there if you want, you know, a lot of spectators. But people showed up, like they sat in the lobby, they saw us, they got some autographs, some selfies. But yeah, I mean, if you add a live element, like this chess boxing thing that's about to happen or did happen, don't know when this is gonna come out, but it's, I mean, it's a completely different, yeah. I mean, it's like- What are the uh, <laughs> feelings that you're uh, feeling right now? Terrified? Any new feelings? You know that you're going to perform in front of 10,000 people. Yeah. I'm and terrified. they're probably going to listen to you oh, they will. in the so, arena as well as hundreds of thousands yeah, so, on the internet. So what I. But you're used to the internet. Yeah, so. yeah I'm, I'm used to that. And I'm used to. Like, there's a lot of elements here that I'm, that I'm not used to and I can't really control. So I, don't, I can't ensure the quality of them at all. It seemed like in Toronto, everything is controlled for us yeah. and it's, it's all chess. It's not, you know, nobody's boxing, nobody's mm. making a walkout to the ring. <laughs> and then I was there at the arena today and they were practicing the walkout music. And I just realized how loud it is. Just yeah. like it's so, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, there's a, a truck. Do you have the headphones Yeah, on? we have the headphones and we can hear each other. But the, like we had that in Toronto. Noise canceling, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but we had a studio in Toronto, like a room. Yeah. They have a truck. There is a truck oh, wow. parked outside in like a warehouse. That's what we do at uh, <laughs> the St. Louis Chess Club also. We have a truck, the production truck, but I think they want to build something in-house. Yeah, yeah that'd, so. be, that'd be the best thing. No, it's, 
it's incredible, but we need we need more sponsors. I mean, we these pilot ones they have to run successfully, otherwise no one's gonna sponsor them. Like, and 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 that's that's a bit of the scary thing here is that. On the one hand, I'm just here as a commentator, and I'm just going to talk about the chess, a bit of the boxing, you know. But this is also kind of a pilot for all future potential massive chess boxing events, live events. And that's another thing. You commentate a lot on chess, but not a lot on other things. Yeah. How do you think you're going to handle the boxing side? Uh, good question. Uh, and, and not only that, it's also a good question of how to delegate how much you talk mm -hmm. and every yeah. time you talk you have to find a way to hand it off yeah. or you have to trust one of the other two guys to hand it off and i met them today yeah like yeah. i don't i don't know them at all i've done collabs with ludwig but again it's it's completely different so yeah and 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 they both seem unbelievably zen about the whole thing and ludwig's put on live events before but i'm like i want to go home <laughs> <laughs> i'm so looking forward to my flight on you know i'm looking forward to the event i'm going to do my best and you said this um I was listening to your bit with Amon right before I got here, and you said the nerves are there, but it's all prior. Like once you get rolling, mm -hmm. exactly, you don't have yep. any time to yeah. So yeah, I noticed that with chess especially, but also with other things, like yeah. it's all of it's in your head, yeah, and then you, once you start, you're like, okay, this is I can do this, and all the possible things I was thinking about that could go wrong, they probably won't go wrong, and if something goes wrong, we'll probably be able to fix it. That's at least my feeling when it comes to chess yeah. and also when it came comes to commentary i'm like okay i'm very nervous but once i get into it probably won't be so bad not yeah. only that but you don't enjoy those nerves at the beginning and once you're in it you kind of start enjoying what you're doing yeah, yeah. You're, i can actually do this i'm actually enjoying this and then when you finish you're like yeah looking forward to the next one and then one day before the next one you're like yeah. ah i don't want to do this I, I have nerves and things of that nature do you experience that at all yeah i slept three hours last night like, <laughs> i had to wake up at six in the morning six thirty. i set my alarm to get to jfk and fly and i went to bed thinking okay i'm gonna sleep six hours that's enough i don't sleep on planes so like okay i'll get here and i'll nap i could not sleep i woke up in a in like a cold sweat at like 4 mm. 30. Yeah. yeah it was unbelievable and like I said, I'm 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 tw I just turned 27. I'm I'm realizing that, uh, yeah, I I just get these spikes of just my anxiety is dread. Yeah. So it's just and and instead of thinking about what's gonna go wrong, my brain's like, it's like it, it's gonna go wrong. It's not even like a hypothetical. And then I haven't developed, and I should. I mean, obviously, you should probably go to therapy for things like this. I've just realized that it's only happening, you know, once every X amount of whatever, and it's never about chess, it's just about life or, you know, whatever, some big decision that's coming up or gonna happen. Um, and there's no fighting it for me. I just literally lay there until I either fall asleep or go away. And it, for me, unfortunately, it doesn't happen during the day much because I'm distracted like with stuff like this, but right before sleep, yeah. it's just like, so I slept three hours, but you know. But <laughs> some, somehow it never pans out in the worst way that you're imagining no, no, no. it to pan out, all right? The, all the it's worst usually positive. All the worst shit in life happens when you don't expect it. Exactly. It's like somehow like you're just like, oh, it's going to be fun. And completely goes wrong. And <laughs> yeah. every Always time. Always hits you out of the blue. Yeah. So. On that note, what do you feel is a connection between like really public life and content creation, especially, and, and you're a very public mm -hmm. figure and mental health? Is that a complicated uh, relationship between those things for you? Yeah. Uh, it's also a tough question because there's so many, like there, uh, there's so many ways to answer it. Like start with A and then end in Z. I think first and foremost, we just become this entity on a screen for many, many people. So they don't realize that like we're still human beings and we can, you know, like I just, I'm very open with some of this stuff because I don't feel as though I'm not a competitor. I think it's different. If you're a top five in the world, you can't talk about your nerves in interviews. Like I feel like that. In many ways, it's kind of weird. Yeah, I, I think that we're, we've reached a point where chess players aren't like super private and also try to yeah. become more personable and open themselves up to the public. But f traditionally, yeah, that you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I, like, I, and this, this is one of the things I also, I, I wouldn't ask people in, in, in my conversations with them about weaknesses or, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a huge role and everybody's different. Like I am the same exact person that I was in 2019. I had no YouTube, no Twitch. Like, I don't treat humans any differently than I would. Uh, I probably get, you know, invited or at least recognized or, or a little bit more well-known than, than maybe normal. But it's, it's, it's hard because me personally, I, I, things that go through my mind are, I hope I can be separated from, 
any short clip that or video that you saw where I made some joke. No context, or, nothing. Yeah, and, and I mean that specifically about the chess world. I couldn't care less about, like if a fan got offended, I said something in a third. And, and that's happened because I've made some jokes like, you know, the bishop is in jail. And I'll make some joke about, you know, Catholicism, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. like, you know, some people get yeah. very mad about that. And th that stuff I don't care about because life's too short. But I, I mean, in terms of, I have to go back and think like, will that person not go on my podcast because I made some joke about them? Or, or God knows, you know, maybe I, I once was like, yeah, Magnus destroyed this person or you destroyed this person. I made some joke about how bad the game was. And like, this is the stuff that goes through my mind. And um, I, I have to battle with the sort of, like, is there a degree of, you know, just like respect or, or just like if you, if you meet me, you realize like I'm, I'm just like a normal person. I'm not crazy one extreme or another. Um, that's the type of stuff that I kind of think about. And uh, yeah, it, I mean, there, there's so many, there's so many layers here because there's the whole up and down of your, your viewership, like hot and cold times, your revenue could be 30 to 40% different every single month, like depending on, you know, your impression. So it's weird. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a weird profession when it's linked to mental health. Uh, I think you guys have it pretty good right now here. You know, at, when you podcast with folks, it's like 100% genuine, not something you have to really uh, overthink. I, I will say it's, it is, it is strange for sure. Uh, sometimes I just kind of want to walk around and there's times where I'm, I'm just walking on the street and it's just a matter of time basically. Yeah. And mm -hmm. especially in, in New York. Yeah. Right? In New York, 90% of people that meet you and, and everyone has been great. I have never had a bad interaction somewhere. You know, folks don't really know what to say. They sort of yeah. freak out, but yeah it gets a little tough because you, you can't make friends mm, because yeah. everyone looks at you like you're either a zoo animal or a god or they shake when they meet you. And it's, it's interesting, you know, it's, and, and it's like humbling and it's, it's amazing to have so many people like share stories of how you got them through tough times, but it's, 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 it's odd. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very weird because also like you have interactions with people and they're super nice, let's mm -hmm. say they're fans or whatever, uh, and you, you want to give them your time and to be polite but then they're if they're followed up by like 10 more people at some point you're like this this is too much and then at some point you have to be like you have to say no even though you want to be nice to to the fans uh, i've never said no you've never said no to a photo signature or whatever no I, i've actually never i've been a bit lucky because when i've been caught in big groups like 20 people in las vegas in the tournament for example my friends actually by like the eighth or ninth one were like all right we yeah. gotta you know uh, and, and a few, a few times I think people kind of realized I was getting swarmed, mm -hmm. but yeah, there, I've, I've never said no. I mean, one time recently in Toronto, I was running back cause there was no Ubers and I'm just, you know, I'm carrying my dress shoes. I got to get back to the commentary. Uh, and a guy just in the middle of the street's like, I know you, like, it was like <laughs> just the space cadet that kind of guy, like super nice guy. And I'm like, oh, I'm in a rush, man. Sorry. And he's like, no, man, I love your videos. We just kind of had one of these. So I, I felt bad and I was like, you want to grab a selfie? And he's like, I don't have my phone. I was like, Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, mine's going to die. So I got to, you know, but I don't think I've ever said, you know, said, no, I'm sort of like, even I've had very stressful moments and I, uh, I'm a block away from home. Some jogger It's like, are you Levy? I'm like, no. <laughs> it's yes, always the most I random am. things like yeah. on the street. I had the weirdest one recently, like probably two months ago. I'm like walking to a movie theater in my neighborhood. And it's right by a big street, mm -hmm. and this car comes zooming by, and then like it starts kind of swerving, and there's one front, and he almost like crashes into one, and then he like turns to the side, and like I'm I'm about to get shot, because like, he's like turning right into me, and and he had noticed me, and he was like a chess fan, and then he asked for a photo, but the guy <laughs> nearly had a car accident because of this, oh my God. and then he like tagged me on Instagram with the photo. I was like, this is so, I mean. People are, people are kind of nuts sometimes. We've, we've been recognized, uh, yeah, I've been recognized on foot by people in cars in Toronto. I got yelled at by, I didn't know who was yelling. It was just like a guy in a car. And then later that night I streamed for an hour and guy's like, yo, my friend saw you. He was the dude in the car. <laughs> oh my God, that's so crazy. Uh, we've been in the reverse too. We've, we've been on like scooters, electric scooters, and we stop at a red light and we just hear, Gotham chess? <laughs> and they like run up to you and... Yeah, I, I, lucky that even with all my, you know, nonsense jokes and reacting to, you know, hate comments here and there, I have not, you know, you don't experience this type of stuff, really negative stuff in person. It's completely positive. And I mean, some people get a little too much, you know, they want to sell you on something. But for the most part, it's 
it's very good actually staying on that uh, tangent the mental health and the mm -hmm. comments um you actually do something very interesting you pin the worst possible comment on yeah. every single youtube video and that i think you were the first one that did that um how do you deal with that why why do you do it is it yeah. like a defense mechanism what no. is it so the interesting thing is i i actually don't care about comments whatsoever i like i could I could stop interacting with negativity like tomorrow if I really wanted to. And I guess that's what all addicts say. So maybe I can't. Maybe I'm <laughs> lying to myself and to you guys. But, I, and I told this to Lex Fridman, I can't break away from the fact that I'm just a human at the end of the day. And if you say some nasty stuff to someone, yeah. like, you know, if somebody curses you out, like you're going you're gonna to say something to them. You may imagine you're just driving, right? And some guy like rolls the window down, says something. Like, it, it stimulates something within you. Like, what? you're not going to talk to me like that. Right. You and, want to answer, of course. Yeah, and you can't really answer on the internet. Like, what are you, what are you going to do? Uh, and so when I first started out on YouTube, I, I did get a lot of, you're a knockoff, I got motor, you're whatever, your sarcasm is ridiculous, you know. And I was just getting these comments. It's like, oh, I can pin these comments. Mm. More people are going to react to them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that means they're going to get into an argument in the thread and... They're gonna have fun. Like they're gonna keep coming back and seeing. Oh, well, like what? It does help what? with engagement, right? It does. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure if I ran a sample of like 50 videos with pin comments and 50 without, I don't necessarily think the 50 with would do better because at the end of the day, it's the content. Like if it's an interesting video, the ones without the pin comment will do will do well. But uh, yeah, it sort of became just like a tradition. Not on every video, I would take like breaks. Then somebody would write something very you know ridiculous. But the the, the tricky thing with the pin comments is. You actually have to, like, it's a real crazy, like, hateful or super over the top yeah, comment. Yeah, yeah. And now, as time goes on, you get people faking those. You get people, uh, or not faking them, but just writing them on every video until you finally, you know, see their comment out of, like, the, you know, several like hundreds. Copy pasta type of thing, yeah? Yeah, and, and, and just writing totally deranged comments. But then if I click their profile, three videos probably like, yo, man, love the video, you know? So. <laughs> As they actually a, want to get paid. Yes, exactly. And it's sort of become, it's, it's gotten very tough, but, but I still get them. I still get, you know, um, you know, Levy, I noticed your channel is dying and it's because of your clickbait, like channels at an all time high, like yeah. viewership, subscription, yeah. like everything's good. All my, you know, I've got a good content pipeline, been putting out interesting content. Levy, I noticed you're, it's like you get, you, you just get coached, which just goes back to that thing is when you're not at the absolute top as a competitor. And even, even that I'm sure you get. God knows how much coaching, like, you know, you're bad at rapid and blitz. You got to do this. And, you know, you get these people like whatever they, they all think, you know, they all think they can coach you. I get that a lot because I'm not the top as a competitor. I'm a content creator. So people who watch for a long time, they think they have equity in the content that you make. So you get a lot of recommendations for things you should and shouldn't do. And I'm like, some, one of my favorite comments to respond is like, okay, you make a YouTube channel. Like you implement this stuff. I will subscribe. I will shout you out. No problem. You know? Did you ever uh, change your behavior based on the comments? Because I had that experience at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, we started off at the end of the summer. In yeah. August, it was super hot in St. Louis, and I was wearing shorts. And then I got all these comments at the beginning with Yasser. Yasser was wearing a nice shirt. Mm -hmm. Fabiano always in uh, jeans. And I was wearing shorts. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like, don't show your legs on the podcast. And they changed me. I haven't worn shorts really? since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you change your behavior? Some, some little things I'm, I'm okay uh, I'm okay with changing, uh, but no, at the end of the day, it, I, I, I can't remember if there is something I changed. I might change something about the layout. Yeah. Like right now I'm playing around with P sounds on, I've never had them on. And I just kind of wanted to see what the community would say. And, but I, I've also done the opposite. I've pulled the audience before and I've done the complete reverse. Mm. So like the <laughs> losing number in the poll <laughs> I would do, cause I thought it was the right thing to do yeah. and it would do great. So it's, it's just the internet is such a weird place. It is. It's like yeah. it's it's fascinating, but it's also kind of unnatural because we're not supposed to hear from millions of people. Mm -hmm. Like it's just not normal that we hear millions of people's opinions on ourselves. Yeah. Or that we can give our opinions to millions of people. Yeah. And people get so invested. It's like if they watch you for two years, they're like they feel part of it. Yeah. And uh, the same with like chess players, right? Like someone's been watching my chess for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then they suddenly want to like give me advice or like coach me or something. I'm like, you know, this is, this is yeah. not the, the status quo here. Like right? the 2800 here, yeah. But I get a, a, so many uh, challenges on like Instagram or mm -hmm. Twitter, like play me, I, I bet I could beat you. Like, 
like let's play three minute you know i've been trained for this since like i never play them but, <laughs> yeah, but you know. it, it, that that's just to play you like people say all sorts of that that's that's the thing once you're it's like your full-time profession you realize people just say certain things like that that's just because they you know they would do anything to play you in the game versus yeah you get the the psychoanalysis ones mm -hmm. and i get that a lot because I, i've been very open with I, I'm not dedicating anywhere near as much time to be like a successful 2400 rated player nowadays, which is still ridiculous amounts of study. I mean, these kids know literally everything. There's chessable courses on everything. They all, <laughs> they got no lives. They're just home all day. You know, I, I forgot who said that, but like they have nothing to do with it. You know, Wesley said it, I think in Toronto. They got yeah. no girlfriend, no, <laughs> no boyfriend. <laughs> like they just, yeah. um, and they just study chess all day. So it made, it made it tough. And, it, and, that's when a lot of this kind of like mid game anxiety that I never felt in my life just started creeping up. And every time I would screw up in the game, I would just, there's like this sickening mm -hmm. feeling in chess you have when you just want to like uproot your entire life. Cause you mm -hmm. played one bad move. You're mm -hmm. like, I'm going to go home. I hit the fucking gym. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a piece <laughs> of shit. Like, um, I felt that against you actually, like yeah. it, in our game, we had a pretty back and forth game. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, like I was on fire that tournament. I'm like, Oh my God, I come back to chess. Like I'm, I'm doing so well. And, uh, and I think I blundered early on and actually you were, I yeah. think you were much better at the beginning but and then I somehow managed to get back into it was, the game. Yeah. So you blundered the pawn and I realized you blundered. I started walking around like planning how I was going to get a GM norm. Cause like <laughs> if I beat you, I just needed like two draws and it was like, it was crazy. I always do that as well. And oh, then man. I get back to the board. I'm like, oh, this is not so easy. Yeah. And immediately I like over, I overestimate my position. And then I was worse. And I was defending for a long time and then I lost. And like that game just, oh my God, it's like games like that are just awful. It's six hours of just getting your, yeah. just obliterated. But that's actually the story of like my chess career. Like I'm right there. I almost never get wiped off the board. It's always, I'm actually starting out red hot. And then I just, you know, and yeah, but I get, I probably got 500 emails, like long emails telling me how, why I should see a sports psychologist. And I actually had to stop reading comments for the first time mm. in one of my last tournaments. While you were playing. Yeah, because I just I just couldn't like all the comments were trying to coach me in some way or cheer me up, and I just like I was like I can't. This is actually the really interesting thing I think about chess specifically. I, I read this in a book one. I think it was King's Gambit. The book was called but not. It was about chess, but no no like chess games or anything. Mm -hmm. It was just about chess personalities and stuff. And it was like, if you play basketball for fun, mm -hmm. and you realize you or tennis or whatever, and you realize you kind of suck, it it doesn't really affect you. Like, you don't care. I mean, I play tennis, I, I suck, I don't care. Yeah. But people who invest a lot of time in chess and then they don't improve or they make serious mistakes and and it feels very personal because it's like, it's not just a physical thing or mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm just not built for this. It's some, it feels like some sort of intellectual thing, which it shouldn't because, you know, there's a million smart people who suck at chess and a million people who are good at chess who are <laughs> maybe not very bright, but... <laughs> 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 we're not going to, not going to talk about that <laughs> but it's like people take it as a very intellectual thing like if i made a mistake i'm it's like you people always say i blundered like how how can i be such an idiot yeah. it's like it's something different somehow with yeah. chess uh, there's uh, there, there's a lot of people who are like successful in, in the business world or just other walks of life corporate world and in, in, in some capacity that actually try to imprint their own learning technique or something that has like made them successful in the real world to chess. Like they only do chess a certain way. Like it's all wrong. There's no way to reinvent the wheel. Like there's mm -hmm. four or five ways to kind of slowly improve at the game as a beginner. You know, you got to learn like a couple openings or whatever Patterns, tactics. Whatnot, that, yeah. yeah. And everybody has their own way. Like I've, I've known people who, who just, you know, they just cheat every game. They just like play with stockfish every single game. And they're like, well, I mean, I, yeah, I'm cheating, but like, um, you know, I'm <laughs> using stockfish to learn its patterns and I'm getting better. It's like the whole like Indonesia scandal basically. Mm -hmm. But oh yeah, yeah. I was gonna, actually going to bring that up because that was uh, when we were talking yeah, about like the internet or... and yeah, yeah. When, when you, that was a when you rightfully said uh, uh, month uh, of time, dude. <laughs> that was wow. And you were getting like death threats from. In an easy people, yeah, but right? they, they were like, never oh. gonna fly over here. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> it's like of course not. Two thousand dollars round trip, but yeah. But um, this was a fascinating thing because yeah. it was ob obvious to any good player, yeah. and you were like, you immediately recognize this guy's cheating. Yeah. And any good player is like, okay, this is obviously cheating. Yeah. But there are millions of people who don't know chess very well, yeah, and who took it very personally, and they're like, you're a sore, sore loser. And, and the Facebook post was what started it all. Like. The, this guy, you know, again, we, we don't actually know who did the cheating. It could have been the mm. son, could have mm. been the, the, the father. Uh, and so this Facebook post by the son was to, to like a completely untrained eye makes it seem like the father, you know, 
plays against Shredder, mm -hmm. writes the he's, moves he's down, and, yeah. Yeah, and learns you know the c technique of the engine, which is ludicrous. Like that's that's crazy to any chess player. Uh, and you know played this big streamer who mass reported this guy and got him banned. That was like the story. When the story was whoever was actually playing on this account at some point won 27 games in a row at 95% caps. <laughs> <laughs> like you know very clearly toggling to this Shredder thing. And uh, I didn't even use the guy for content at all. Like it was a random 10 minute game in the middle of a stream. And I went, I think he's cheating, got banned, end of story. Um, and you had nothing to do with the ban. It was just chess.com flagged the- Yeah, no, I mean, I just What would have happened regardless of what you said yeah, I, like, did. I sent, I sent the account to like Fairplay team. I was like, can you scan this guy? It's like, what I do? I mean, nine, 19 out of 20 accounts get banned. Every now and then I encounter one anonymous 2800 that is a human. It's not an AI, you know, it's like some anonymous title player. I'm like. I mean, I've had like real titled accounts cheat against me just in not even title Tuesday. Like I was really? playing, I've been yeah. playing Blizz before. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Mm -hmm. Like you, you, you can tell if, if for five or six moves in a row, you completely miss a move, something's going on. <laughs> you just, you see moves coming. Sometimes you go, oh, I didn't realize the idea. But I just like reported this account. It got banned. It's like, it's not even, it's no money. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are we doing? So. I mean, I've, I've got a good eye for it, but yeah, that story was wild. I mean, death threats, they were going to my Instagram and seeing people I followed and writing to them to like really? go kill wow. themselves or kill me or whatever. Um, they wrote crazy things to my wife. And I, that was, that's actually the reason I don't have DMs on anymore on anything, like message requests. I still get Dewa Kipas comments. I have my TikTok now mm -hmm. for two weeks. <laughs> Do you remember Dewa Kipas? It's been two <laughs> years. I still get these comments. <laughs> It's like, it's, it's insane. And you know, some people don't even like realize what happened. They just still think that the guy's legit and. Yeah, but it's like chess is sort of not very accessible to yeah. most people who haven't invested a lot of time in it. And then suddenly it exploded with the pandemic and mm -hmm. a lot of people who never played chess before. And then they're just like, we don't know anything, but we're still going to give our opinion mm -hmm. and even take it like way too far in that case. It reminds me of this, like, do you remember Max Deutsch? Yeah, yeah, of course. This this guy who was like, I'm going. You remember this? No, no it's like no, I don't think I know. I'm much. going to create an algorithm to learn chess, and I'm going to play Magnus Carlson. Oh yeah, I remember. His whole thing was he yeah, learns yeah, yeah. a skill in 30 yeah. days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like 30 minutes before the game, he's like, Yeah, the computer hasn't finished the algorithm. But we knew that that's <laughs> complete bonkers, right? Yeah, but maybe like maybe he was legit. Maybe this guy was just delusional. And maybe most people were like, oh, yeah, maybe he'll create this uh, AI to figure out chess, you know? And he played like seven moves of theory, like lost a pawn, and lost the game bye -bye. immediately. Yeah. Yeah, and Which then... is what do you expect from a beginner playing Magnus or any strong player? Yes. Right. And very recently from uh, the real world is the story of uh, Liver King. I don't know if you follow <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I like that. This uh, big jack yeah, guy yeah. and you could easily see that he's on steroids, yeah. right? But there's still people that buy his supplements and mm -hmm. think that he actually eats uh, raw liver and mm -hmm. raw testicles and yeah. things of that nature. And that's how he got shredded. And of course, recently, uh, I think it was an email uh, that showed how many steroids he he's not. taking. It's like 12K uh, per month worth of steroids, which is absolutely ridiculous. But anybody that lifts knows that that's not possible right. um, naturally. So it just reminds me of um, this problem with cheating. Speaking of that, what do you think we need to do about it? I mean, it's a huge problem we have in the world of chess. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem um, online and I mean, over the board. Now it's very easy to be suspicious of basically anybody. Yeah, anybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a good question. I'm glad I don't have to, you know, I don't have to put in the guidelines. I, I, I don't I don't think it's ridiculous to have players take their shoes off. Like I saw, I saw this Facebook, I mean, you, you might completely disagree. Like, I don't know. I, no, I, I think it's a huge problem. And if the solution is removing your shoes, yeah, then that's not the small worst price thing. To pay. Yeah, it's a small price to pay. And the truth is, okay, what happens if you just can tape it to your armpit and it will get past every single detector, including the one that's $10,000? What do you do? That's an interesting one. I never like thought about that. This guy, yeah. Mike Boyd on mm -hmm. YouTube. Yeah, I, I saw. Yeah, the video that he made. I mean, it was a little over the top because it was like a sex toy. You can blur that out. <laughs> but uh, and, and, you know, he was showing how you can like put it in your foot. And unless you, you know, tap it with the wand, it won't get detected. I think they're going to have to employ some very sophisticated. But what know, kind? Like, Cause it's because then it's a privacy how, matter. X-rays, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's a problem. What would people agree to? How sophisticated can you can you get without 
it being incredibly invasive or intrusive or unpleasant for chess players. Yeah, I mean, what happens if Hans becomes the world champion? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know there's a... I mean, I, I, I think there's this, there's this thing that people will naturally go for the easiest solution in yeah. pretty much anything. And in chess, it's just the easiest solution to winning that chess is to use an engine because yeah. it just tells you the moves. Uh, and we've ignored the problem for a really long time because we had an honor system. We thought mm -hmm. chess players are honest and especially good chess players are fair and would never cheat. And now we're like, well, maybe they might and we're not 100% sure anymore. So what do we do now that we're yeah. not sure anymore? Yeah. And for the record, like when, when I mention Hans, it's just because there is still the outstanding chance that he plays a match, you know, stripped down in a Faraday cage with every <laughs> single, you know, one of these like completely. And, and what happens if the guy is just truly like 27, you know, 100 strength and, and keeps gaining and plays the candidates and whatever, six to eight years. I mean, there's like this, there, there's just this situation that I keep bringing up anytime I feature him in a video because they all do so well. I will not, you know, hide, a, hide that fact. Uh, like it, it either is or isn't, right? Like this is all either a fairy tale or it's like completely 100% legitimate yeah. and that just blows my mind. Like I, I just can't wrap my head around it. Do you think so? Because I, I feel like there is a chance that it's in the middle, that he is a very good player who has cheated in the past. And this is like the scariest prospect. But we know he has cheated in the past. But that he's also Online. a very good player and that he's not even... Because there was speculation, what's his real strength? And I think his real strength is just at 2,700 mm -hmm. and not you know, much higher as he claims, but also not much lower as many people claim. But he's also willing to you know, take that extra push to become the best player in the world. Yeah, I again, I don't know, and I don't, I don't remember what his suit ultimately said. Like, I don't remember if he's even contending against the report, you know, because he, he went live and he kind of said what he said. I didn't read into like whether in his case, they're, they're saying that that was like under duress or that was kind of an emotional response or if like they're admitting that, you know, that's the reality. That, that, that's actually like a, like a thing. A lot of really young, talented players might cheat a little bit, <laughs> a little bit online. And then, I mean, and I think Anish brought this up at some point, like what if that just sort of becomes part of their training regimen? Mm -hmm. It's not as ridiculous as the business executive that cheats every move and says he's, you know, learning from Cypher. What if you just cheat two moves a game in every single game that you play or like one move or, you know, okay, you don't do it for a little bit. That's the scariest thing for any of these online events. And you've played some of these online events. I know they have like the two cameras and they make you screen share. I feel like you can cheat online, even with all those measures, so easily. Yeah, like, yeah, I can. <laughs> so I'll just go into a bit of a tangent here because it's it's an interesting subject, um, and you're absolutely right. You can cheat very easily. Uh, these online tournaments started in 2020, early yeah. 2020. It was the Chess 24 stuff first. It was the tour, and I had no. I was like, okay, you know, it's a. I'm playing with the guys. Yeah. I, I was. I didn't have any suspicions. Then, uh, the whole uh, Trojan things happen. Mm -hmm. Happens. I feel really weird during the game, like. I'm being cheated against, but I don't say anything to anyone except for Roostum. I'm like, the guy was probably cheating. And then we started thinking and getting increasingly paranoid, the two of us. Mm -hmm. We were like, it's so easy. We hadn't thought of it before, but it's so easy because you don't have to follow the first line. You just incorporate some blunders, incorporate, you play on your own for like 70% of the game, 80% of the game. Yeah. You get a hint here. Someone just tells you, you know, this is a winning position. Or someone just tells you this is the valuation, so it's like you're confident and you're like, okay, I'm on the right path, and I know that I'm at worst. So there's, you know, um, all these things are turn a 2700 player into a 2900 player, especially online, and it's impossible to detect. That's, and just because I have a camera here, there, and there, it doesn't matter because you're never going to get a full 360 view of the room. Yeah, even if they ask you to do that, like I had to do that. I had to show my webcam the whole room. What happens if I do that? And, and then, then someone I comes in an after. Element. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. Chess24 implemented this thing at some point, which was, uh, I only played in one event where they did this, but they were getting a lot of complaints, uh, I think, about, you know, like people were getting uh, very paranoid and suspicious. So they implemented this thing where the players turn show their, the inside of their ear mm -hmm. to the camera. First of all, I'm not sure you can actually see anything through a webcam looking right. into your ear. But after that, players were free to get up, which is the funniest thing in the world because you, know, you can get go up, go to another room, and whatever put want. whatever yep. you want in your ear. And it's like, yeah, you can, put all the, you can implement all the measures you want, but you will never do it for other reasons too. Like, let's say I'm a top player, 
and during the middle of the game, I just leave because I say I need to use the bathroom. Chess.com, Chess24, they're not going to to disqualify Magnus or Hikaru or Ding or anyone yeah. for this because it would be a scandal. It'd be like, I had to use the bathroom. Yeah. But you can also do that and just like, you know, get some advice from another room. And there will never be a protection against this. You know, all the cameras in the world won't protect against that. Yeah. And that's not only for uh, online tournaments, right? Even in live tournaments, you can have somebody in the audience just raise their hand, stretch at one particular moment, signaling. and then yeah. you will get a signal and you will know mm -hmm. that you're better, you will know that you have to find something, whatever. So it's a big problem we have with uh, live chess as well, and we were trying to figure out how to deal with that, and we couldn't find a solution. We're thinking about uh, that for the Grand Chess Tour and things of that nature, because obviously now we have the, for online, we have the 15 or 30 minute delay, and that's going to solve some problems. But if you have a live event and you have an audience, how are you going to stop the audience actually signaling I, I, something? I also feel like you, you cannot ever have a delay if you want to popularize the game. Exactly. That's, like That's a problem. problem. Mm -hmm. That's a huge problem. Like, yeah. What, I mean, the, whole, the whole spectacle is watching it happen live, you know, feeling the rush. With the, like, well, yeah. I can just Google the result of the I know World it Cup. Finished. And, yeah, I know it finished. Yeah, yeah, the World Cup is 75th minute, but I can Google <laughs> it and I see the result. I mean, it's right. Like, it's, yeah, there's no solution. Everyone's like, oh, delay. And I'm just like, my entire job at this point He's it's trying absolute. to get as many new people to watch the game, and I, I can't do it anymore. I'm lucky I do recaps, but if I have to do live coverage... I mean, what, yeah. yeah, with delays, it's, it's really... It's not good, but what's the alternative? Because cheating destroys it even more than a delay, mm -hmm. right? You know, that yeah. destroys the entire integrity of it. I think you just have to uh, put ridiculous penalties for cheating. Like, yeah, well, your I've, career is pretty much over. I've once thought, you cheat once, your career is over. And I've thought about this for the young guys. Like, if you're under 18, maybe you get one more chance. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what if you're 17 and 11 months? Sure. I mean, okay, you're whatever. A minor. You get, yeah, yeah. You, you get like the minor penalty, and then maybe 16 because so many kids are already really like brilliant players yeah. at 16. And then, if you do it as an adult, it's like a permanent suspension from online play for, I mean, it's like uh, popping for performance enhancing drugs, right? You, the, the first it should be two years and then five and then I don't know, lifetime ban or something. It's always something completely crazy, like two years. I mean, if you're banned from online events for two years, that's a huge amount of time. You lose a bunch of income, but for a young player, it's not going to be a serious setback for their career. Yeah, yeah, that's, and that's the scary thing. Like they can all cheat. And, 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 and there's not, nope. yeah, they, they actually know that if they get caught, there won't be much repercussion. Especially, like pl young players like, have gotten problem. caught. That's a problem. Yes. And they've been banned. And then it's uh, like we talk about these guys, and I won't want to name any names, but we're like, you know, half of them are like, yeah, they cheated. The other half is like, no, they didn't. I don't think they did. And then they just continue. They go on. The only way is to name them, to shame them. Oh, but it's not even comparable to PEDs because in with PEDs you can still lose. Yeah, of course. With stockfish, yeah. it's impossible to lose. Sure. Like it's yes. over, the game yeah, is yeah, over, yeah, you're yeah, a god. Yeah, yeah, the game is over, yeah. Um, you play god, you yes, can decide you're, you're when you, you know, you can I also mean, like lose on purpose, basically. Oh, I actually, this was one of the things that when I was, when I was talking with Rustam two years ago, and we were having this revelation, like at some point we used to play training games where we know the other guy is using, a, I was playing against him, mm -hmm. and I was like, I'll use a computer, and uh, we'll see how the game goes, and he did the same against me. And when you looked at the game after, it was a shit show. Blunders everywhere. But I just controlled the game. It mm -hmm. was like, yeah, I'll make a mistake here, and then I'll get to an equal position. And mm -hmm. then people make so many mistakes. He's a like, really strong grandmaster. He was making so many mistakes that I didn't even have to create a good game. I just created some sort of you know, mess and played quickly. And, uh, and then we realized, yeah, you can also just lose because mm -hmm. you control the tournament situation too. It's, it's such a... Once someone has this idea, it's like... They just need to have the motivation, and then it's hard to stop them. Yeah, and anybody above the baseline titles, like 23, 2400, can, with very little practice, know how to be a good cheater. I even sometimes feel it in Title Tuesday that someone cheats half the game and then mm -hmm. loses. I just, like, I'm, my mind is blown. Like, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's, I don't remember if I mentioned this right before we started recording. I'll say it again. But it's like, you, you get five or six moves in a row against an opponent. You just, every move, you're just sitting there like, it's not that you, you, usually you see moves coming or you miss one or two. It's just seven or eight move ideas in a row. You're just like, what? And then they lose. They just, you just start blundering. Play, yeah. yeah, and lose I on time. I noticed that. It's, so, it's, like, it's so weird. It's unnerving and, and yeah, and, and there's no money involved. I mean, people are just doing this for fun. They're just. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's very unpleasant because it, it's like, you feel like you're being gaslit. It's like, yeah. 
I, I feel like the guy is like some random guy, 2200 is just outplaying me like consistently that mm-hmm. entire game and suddenly just starts blundering all their pieces. I'm like, what just happened? Yeah. Or, or the opposite, like I'm totally winning and they have one second left, I have a minute and they're like 2200. Suddenly it's equal. And it's... suddenly they like defend with one second left, like yep. perfectly. I'm like, how does this happen? I it's know. just, it's so weird. And I'm like, did they cheat? Did they not? I don't know anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And you know that you've played, I mean, you've played over the board before the internet, before playing online 90% of the time, you've played with 2200s and 99% of the times so you're going to be able to they're trick so them. You're, you're going to beat them easily. <laughs> they're so bad. <laughs> like they're really online, bad. <laughs> and then online you see these guys like, which you know that they're uh, winning like six games masters in, a row. in yeah. real life. Or like, or like 40 years old. Like and they have like, public accounts. I've like lost to people who are in their 40s and exactly. they're 2100 feet. I'm like, I'd win a hundred games. And they're 2900 yes, on Chess.com. I would beat them a hundred out of a hundred games over the board. How? I'd beat like, them like how they if I didn't sleep for three days <laughs> and they just destroy it. I'm sitting there like, no, this doesn't make any sense. But again, you can't, it's like taboo to call it out. You cannot accuse yeah, yeah. without having Because you don't know for sure, right? Yeah, and you, you and, and even like, that's a one-on-one situation, but you also like, you can't accuse, you know, some players who are young, promising, you know, 18 year olds. Mm-hmm. Like there's no, there's no pipeline for any of this stuff. Yeah. And I've thought of, about, well, you know, I I could be the new source. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be that guy. There's like big YouTube channels that expose, you know, financial scams or mm-hmm. influencers who mm-hmm. promote like CoffeeZilla. He's a like, famous guy. Who mm-hmm. Exposes a lot of different, you know, sponsors, crypto and all, and, and all stuff. I'm like, I don't want to. That's not that's not my job for chess. Yeah. And you take a lot of heat for it. Yeah, you too. take a lot like, of heat. Incredible it, amount. Yeah. It, it's, why would I? You know. It, but also, I, I saw this phenomenon. It's like you. There's a title Tuesday, and you have you know Magnus Hikaru, mm-hmm. whoever else is playing, and then you have some guy. He's like. Candidate master, mm-hmm. seven out of seven against grandmasters, and then just loses all the rest of the games. I'm like, this is really weird. Yeah. Because this doesn't happen. It maybe happens like one in a million. Mm-hmm. Because you, you know this is like a 600 point rating difference, seven out of seven. It just doesn't happen, and then they lose the rest of the games. And I'm like, well, what what do you say? It's very weird. But what do you say about it? And yeah. the, the scariest is that the cap score isn't even damning. It's like 79, 84. Like they, yeah. they just outplay these guys just enough to beat them every exactly. game. I'm like. What what is going on here? And for no money, they they don't they never cash out. Yeah, because they they know they'll you know they'll be banned or whatever. It's yeah. it's it's very. But I feel it's easy to cash these twenty two twenty three hundreds, but it's so no, difficult it's if the player is cash. already established. Yeah, and that's the scary thing. Like take whatever 2600, 16 years of age, mm-hmm. he cheats here and there, and then gets twenty seven hundred. People expect that because he's young. He's supposedly uh, going to improve very very quickly. But he's cheating in like 40% of the times. I mean, it's just Even so less, difficult. Like, yeah. it, 20% yeah. of the times, it's so difficult to actually catch this one. This is what uh, Grishik said. Yeah. He recently said, I saw this on Reddit, that if we ever come, if we ever discover the full scope of chess cheating, we would be astonished. Hmm. And I, I've, I've also thought that, that we might see top players, unfortunately. It will probably never get exposed. But if we did, we would probably be surprised at how far-reaching it actually became but, and, but we'll probably never be there because also because if a top player was cheating what level of certainty would you need to accuse them you would need like just you know red-handed to be called red-handed yes yeah. it would be too too difficult otherwise to to accuse to someone yeah you know. i mean if you're 2700 2750 if you get accused the accuser is going to get so much heat yeah, you if would they need. Don't have you would need video evidence. evidence yeah. Video yeah. evidence. Yeah, it's just cash them in the bathroom or something like that. I mean, it's uh, absolutely ridiculous. Just changed a lot in the last like three years, right? Do you feel that way as well? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I can't. I can't give a response that will you know sound any, any different than yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I I noticed it for the very very first time in 2020 because the Queen's Gambit came out. The trailer. And then my video was in the sidebar, like how to play the Queen's Gambit. Yeah. And the video went from getting, you know, I don't know, 500 views every 24 hours to like 25,000. And then that just sort of, that's the way like algorithm works essentially. I mean, once you start seeing the same face, it starts being like, oh, you like that? Okay, well, like how about this full video? Oh, you like that? Okay, well, here's like 400 of them, everything, yeah, yeah, all the time, so. Is that uh, weird that you, when you create content, you also have to think about this thing, which is, not human, but some sort of organic thing, and it decides your success, yeah. and nobody fully understands it. Yeah, no, no nobody fully. Mysterious algorithm. Yeah, there's a, and there's a whole community of, of, of YouTubers who 
they've been in the game a long time. They stress a lot less about their numbers. They sort of, and there's ecosystems of, of people and ways to get in, in touch with, you know, actual YouTube employees, because YouTube is just impossible to reach. Uh, I, for the longest time, I was hearing about a partner manager, hmm. like a person that, you know, you don't need to, I thought, you don't need to chat with support. It's this person that helps you build your channel. It's like a human being. And I finally, you know, got approved to partner manager program. I got an email. First of all, it looked like spam. Hmm. It looked like legitimate spam. Then I, I got on a call, a uh, very nice guy, but wouldn't tell me any information about himself. Like none. Just, and it, it's much less personal than I thought. It's much less like, oh, let's collab and you'll help me with certain things. It was just kind of like, have you thought about using, you know, a couple features I've never used before, Premiere and just mm -hmm. different YouTube features. It's very impersonal. It was just very much, and I realized at that point, like this was a totally, this is completely impossible to learn things about YouTube unless you talk to people like Mr. Beast or people who sort of, you know, play the algorithm all the time. But there's creators that upload a video every four uh, weeks and they get 7 million views. Yeah, and they, they've just figured it out somehow. They just, they just you know, Tirzu, great example. Like, I like that guy a lot. And he just makes a video, you know, our insects OP, 10 million views. Very well edited, but you know what you're going to get good title and somehow it just gets like 50 million impressions and you don't know what's going to be on trending like i've been on trending before during the cheating scams like wow I'm fourth on trending like the trending page it's like me wow it's crazy and it just goes away your video goes back to just yeah it's it's definitely super weird and there's days that your monetization disappears for two weeks because of a data reporting yeah. error mm -hmm. you just lost all your money yeah, I saw on Twitter you, you had that issue. I have nobody, like, I don't know who to contact. I just literally, and if you try to contact creator support, you're 121st in line. Yeah. <laughs> How do you handle those peaks and valleys? Well, thank, thank God, uh, thank God I've not been actually demonetized for anything. But um, no, I mean, I, I handle, I, I was handling it very poorly. Was it this more year. difficult at the beginning uh, when you no. first started blowing up or that was, you blew up and you stayed? at the top for a while. I mean, it goes, some it goes in loops and you have like big tournaments or you have world championship. That's always fun. You have cheating scandal. I mean, listen, I like, but I'm very open in my videos. Like it's yeah. a great time for a creator. I would hate yeah. if one of us went on a podcast and went, oh, it's so bad for just shut the <laughs> fuck up. Like what are you, who are you, why are you going to lie to me? Why are you going to be like better than everybody? Like, no, it's like fantastic for a creator. Like yeah. we, this is like perfect. Uh, but uh it, it was tough in the middle of 2022 it was like the lowest point because the school year was starting up again august august was the worst month since like 2020 mm. basically and then in september 4th the famous chess game occurred yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh and like all-time high but i i think also now i've I finally started doing things like TikTok and instagram short form content i never did it because you can't monetize it but i started realizing that's something like i haven't unlocked at all and while I can also get very obsessive with content and learning how things work, I'm also just very lazy. Like, I don't want to break the status quo or add something to my plate. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pain in the ass, though, for sure. Like, these peaks and valleys. And, for example, this Indonesia thing, I had to geo-block my content. They swarmed my YouTube channel. Like, mass, you know, 99% to 40% thumbs up, 20% mm, yeah. they killed my videos. And... I didn't know what to do. Like it was the first time I experienced something like this. So I didn't upload for seven days. Huge mistake when oh. you upload a video every day because yeah. getting that back up is gone. And I had to geoblock my content from Indonesia. So I hired an uh, MCN, like one of these channel networks that owns your ad revenue and pays you. Like it goes to them and then they pay you 90% of it. And the benefit is like certain features like this. Like you have a manager on your channel. You can only geoblock if you work with one of them. Hmm. And it, um, isn't that scary that your entire profession is not really in your control, that you're at the mercy of yes. a mysterious <laughs> company, a mysterious algorithm. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, I mean, 100%, like it, it's going well and I kind of know what I'm doing. And if I really need some help or support with all this, I, I kind of have people who could help. But well, the story here is, uh, so they were taking my 10% away from me for a month. And then to break that contract, the clause was 30 days. Like it doesn't just break, mm -hmm. you break it, 30 days go yeah. by. So I owed them another bit of money. And when you separate, you don't just go back to the monetization program. You're demonetized. Oh my God. I made no from money for, no, for, and I was like, what the, f I was ma making no money for three days. So this is affiliate, this company is affiliated with YouTube. Somehow they have like this arrangement where mm. they, yeah, it's like a, so a plugin, like a bonus plugin that unlocks certain features. Again, at the end of the day, it all comes down to like money and power yeah, and, yeah. you know, control and whatever. It sounds very Kafka-esque. It's like you, <laughs> it, it you is. give your power to this company and then they like, 
they take advantage of you and they it's, all these clauses and stuff that you don't know about at the well, start. Well, no, I, I, I knew, but it was, I, I had to. Mm -hmm. Like, I had to do it. And um, I, I knew going in, like, I was going to lose money, but it was worth it because I, I just saw my entire cha like channel burning to the ground, basically. And maybe I could have just kept uploading and really two weeks would have gone by nobody remembered. Uh, but I didn't know what to do and I sort of panicked. And uh, yes, it, it is very weird. It wasn't their fault I got demonetized, but they never told me that was going to happen. Mm. And so one day, like, we, we break it, like, we're done. I can't monetize my videos anymore. It's like, what do I do? I can't contact support. I have to literally reapply for monetization and wait. So I made a huge, like, big deal about it. And I, you know, I'm, like I said, there's these creator kind of circles. I said, yo, can you, like, help me out? And they got me remonetized. It was the weekend. Mm. So they couldn't remonetize me until Monday. And I got remonetized, but three days went by and my channel just made no money. This happens sometimes. Like, there was a day a couple months ago, monetization broke. Mm -hmm. It was did you guys have this on your channel at all? No, 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 we, we were not monetized at that point. I go to upload a video, I can't put an ad on it. The yeah. ads are playing for the old videos, yeah. but monetization is just dead. It doesn't work. And it took them 20 hours to fix the video that they made no money. Yeah. So yes, uh, I mean, I definitely am sitting there like, what the, so that's, I take interest in other things. Like I'm, I'm I have, various like investments and um i mean i'm I'm pretty interested in in like buying houses like renovating them but i can't do that physical work myself but i i, I in the long run i want to dedicate my brain power to not you know 20 ideas on a sticky note on my desktop of but i think content. you also found a very uh, good strategy because you also have uh, twitter as a tool and your twitter is very active uh, you're very followed and i think you're engaging on twitter as well was that part of the strategy at the beginning when you first started content creation or yeah again it's uh, you know i'm not updating people on you know when i sit on the toilet like there's creators who are like literally every you know everything and, and i've even seen pages where they tweet 20 times a day and they just hope one goes viral yeah i i actually approach twitter very much like this has to be a good tweet like this has to get some traction mm. That's literally it. Like, I'm going to put out a tweet. It'll be witty, funny. It'll get people mad or <laughs> hyped or whatever. It'll get, like, retweeted. Yeah. And uh, Twitter I, is one of those mysterious things as well. I, I noticed it only recently because mm -hmm. I, I was not really active. And then I had this back and forth with Anish a little bit. And he said something about how he got ratioed by one of my comments, which was not intended to do anything. Mm -hmm. And then just for fun, I was like, so this is also ratio. Yeah. And then and I ended up getting, like, my most liked tweet ever. Yeah. And there were people, one guy was like, I don't know who either of these guys are, but it's still impressive that he's managing to race. I'm like, how did you get here? <laughs> exactly. If you don't know either of us, you're not a chess player. You don't know anything about yeah. us. And, and then I got like 2,000 followers in a day. Yep. It was like some crazy growth from nothing. <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing is, as a creator, if you have, at the end of the day, like if you have a pipeline, whether that results in them watching your videos or subscribing to your Twitch channel or that for me, I don't care about Twitch so much, but like they buy one of your courses. And again, like even with courses, for example, you know, it's very much angled for, if you're like 800 and you, and you buy like a course and you learn like some aggressive E4 lines, you're gonna get to 1100, you're gonna have a, have a blast. Yeah. Next time a course comes out, like you're gonna, you know, you're not preparing for world championship. Yeah, yeah. And then people argue with me about this, like, and, and then I get it, you know, people, I always joke like, what are you playing the Petrov for as a 1400? Like, what is wrong with you? You're gonna yeah. go to Madrid? Like, yeah. you're gonna play in Madrid or something? And they can't like, what is crazy like behavior for some of these people? But everybody like learns chess differently. But it's the pipeline. Like, you put out certain kind of content on Twitter or Instagram. Like my Instagram, I, I didn't upload for a long time, and now with TikToks, you can make Instagram reels. And so I hadn't gained any followers in like 10 months because I just didn't care about my Instagram page. And I'm up like 10K in a couple of weeks just because the reels get recommended, people follow, you know, they wanna. And at the end of the day, I don't think it matters a whole lot, mm. but the more followers, the better ultimately. Like if that's what you rely on, you don't need to have a Twitter page, but it's kind of cool to, you know, whatever some people might get in touch with you. Like the more people follow you on different social media, uh, the better. Like some chess players don't have Twitter at all or yeah. aren't verified. But also a lot of chess players don't really think about it's like there's it's the old-fashioned school of thought i'm a chess player i play chess yeah. i don't do anything else yeah yeah that's I mean, that was also my philosophy for a long time i was like i'm not gonna involve myself in twitch like hikaru did it in 2018 i was also asked like do you want to watch us mm -hmm. do you want to start a twitch thing and i did i did a few few streams twitch is so difficult for you for but, it, but in general i was just general. like okay i'm a chess player you know i'll, I'll do some things for fun now and then but yeah. i play chess and that's the now we're realizing that of course chess is not just this Thing we play it's this whole world mm -hmm. and there's a lot of different aspects to it it's That's commentary creation yeah. yeah in the end 
yeah, uh, it it was just a bit sudden for people. You know, it was like in 2020 things exploded, yeah, and it was difficult to adjust for a lot of chess players. And actually, this was a question I was curious about because uh, there is this element of jealousy often, I think, or bitterness uh, from people who are very strong chess players, but then they see you and they're like, "I'm a better chess player than him, but he's so successful and makes so much money and." and is so famous, and you're like, you're more famous than me or so many other chess players. And they are like, this is unfair. Uh, and I've heard this a lot, not just not just about you, but about a lot of like content sure. creators. Like, this guy is, it could be Agamatter, it could be this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a 2700 player, why am I not famous? Like, what, what do you think about that? Uh, I get it. I mean, it goes back to what I said about like way back, like, you know, respect or it, not in, again, respect is like this weird, I, I just mean that like if we were in the same room and I like shook hands with some random, you know, person, like they'd realize like, I'm just like a normal guy at the end of the day. Uh, and yeah, I mean, no pun intended, like in, in some ways chess should speak for itself, right? Mm -hmm. But there's no way for top players to get famous to a level of like a YouTuber, for example, or earn money that creators would make because it's, I mean, it's just like so controlled and it's been the same way for so long. And uh, it, it's such a kind of like specific and niche activity that it, people don't have social media channels. Like they don't realize the value that they could be getting the sponsors that they could be getting or putting on a suit mm -hmm. um, or you know, going to these events or, or getting invited to corporate events in the countries that they live in if there's a market for that or, or, or God knows what else. And some, some have it, like some have it. I mean, Anish does some stuff in the Netherlands. Uh, I mean, the Russian guys, obviously, although there's naturally some controversy with like Russian sponsors. Uh, and things that I don't even, like, I don't know about. I mean, the top player ecosystem and like your knowledge of everything that goes on is like totally different from, from the lay person. But there's a huge disconnect between new chess viewers and viewers in the last three years and top level. Mm -hmm. You guys don't feel it at all. All the benefit goes to the people that make the videos about your games, that, you know, commentate your games, that, well, I guess it kind of ends there, but just in, in general, like talk about the chess, like you play it, but you don't, there's no benefit because it doesn't fucking matter if I get 10 million subscribers. That doesn't affect FIDE like whatsoever. I mean, at the end of the day, like yeah. people make prize funds and people, and yeah, I, I, I get it. And to be honest with you, like in 2019, would there have been any value for you to have like a million followers on everything? Sure, but not- Not as much as now. Not as much as now. Yeah. You'd never know who's gonna call. You never know who's gonna invite you to what show. You never know. And again, the thing is at the end of the day, what what is the, with within what is that is that jealousy or that kind of like desire for more is it is it just money is it fame i i think it's a bit of both for a lot of for a lot of people they're like i worked on chess so much and you, like know, you want to make more money like you want to be more famous you want to be like invited to stuff but you have to like what are you monetizing at the end of the day like mm -hmm. if it's prize funds that's not my fucking problem right? but like, it's also a very competitive field as a top chess player right and a 2750 that has, let's say, 200,000 followers will probably get the invitation uh, based on the followers compared to like 2750 that has a thousand followers mm -hmm. and never posts. Will they? Probably. It, is that a thing that's I gonna happen? So. Like Tata Steel, for example? I think example. it already does. I think, okay, so let's say Tata Steel is a very traditional tournament. They have a traditional system, which is they mostly go by rating. And they also have some personal relationships yeah. that, you know, like when you get invited to Tata Steel, you talk to one guy. Mm. And if you're friendly with, with the, if you know the guy, then, you know, or he might think of you, yeah. you might think, yeah, I, I had this player, let's say uh, it's Richard Rapport, and we have a good relationship and he's a good player. And because if you want to choose between Richard Rapport or let's say Yanni Pamiashi or any, whatever mm -hmm. player, it's like a tiny difference in rating. Okay, with Jan, now it's special because he's playing a world championship. But uh, let's say if you want, between Levon and me, right? It's a tiny difference in rating, who's gonna get the spot? Very much, often it comes down to personal relationships and uh, tiny differences in rating and then, um, you know, what are what are we going to ask for? Because they wanna get, obviously, the, the strongest player who's also the cheapest. But that's the thing, right now, I think the entertainment value is starting to have much more of a value than it used to be. I still think classical chess is too traditional for that mm. at the moment. That's very much the online chess scene. And that's where there's a big disconnect. Yeah. Online chess and then classical chess. Tournaments like Tata Steel, the Grand Chess Tour, 
These are usually based on rating and or personal personal relationships. Chess.com, Chess24 events, this is like young guys, entertaining players, popular players. It's, it's a bit of a, sometimes there's crossover because you know, you have Magnus, you have Nepo, Ding. These are players who cross yeah. over from popular and very strong, right? Uh, but besides that, there is, there is definitely a disconnect. This is why all the young guys get uh, online invitations. And uh, and you have the other guys who get more of the classical and chess invitations. Yeah, at the end, like you have a very good barometer to understand what tournaments are actually bringing in what eyes by YouTube analytics. For example, I did not cover Tata Steel Rapid and Blitz at all because I knew it was going to perform horribly. There is mm. no way there is no way to market it unless Hikaru just goes completely insane and wins the whole tournament. Then you can be like you can start with that and then you can market the rest. It was an incredible game like and, and concept recently of Vichy playing Aragaisi, number one, number two mm -hmm. of India, past versus present, and a very complicated battle, you know? It was my worst performing video in six months. But on the other hand, the best performing chess videos on YouTube are the Indian chess players. Like One is Pragnata against Ganguly, it's like 90 million views or something like that. Right. But Indian audience is different in many ways than like traditional audience, and the thing is, uh, it actually, like, if you were like an Indian creator, like Chess Talk, monetizing is totally different than if primarily your audience is UK, US, Germany. Like, monetizable views are actually mm -hmm. kind of different. Yeah, like those videos have just like insane amounts of views. And, but, but uh, that's a standout. Like, that's just some weird thing that hits the algorithm. And then you know, Magnus Carlsen shortest game ever, fifty yeah. million or or, or, yeah. or something like that. But. If it's like a tournament happening right now, a recap of a tournament will not be popular in two weeks. Mm -hmm. If I can get 400,000 views in two weeks, like that's all I, that's all I need. Chess.com Global Championships recaps did horribly. And I feel as though it's, there was no way to market like every single day, like day one, day two, day three. Mm -hmm. The titles do very poorly. But if there, were Ma if there was Magnus there, oh, of course. it would have been totally no, different, it right? completely, Yeah, totally different story. Like just the car on its own, it's not, it's not like strong enough. And especially if he loses, like yeah. if he wins, then it's like a different story. Uh, yeah, Magnus is uh, number one, like by far. Now it's actually Hans. It's like very close. Like num I mean, I think Hans might even be more popular at this point. But this is an artificial thing. Yes. How long do you think that is going to actually last? Is I, the question. I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, for a while, like at least like three to six months, and then we'll see ultimately what happens. But he might keep doing well and with the loss and everything. Yeah. Lose or win, that's the magic. Like yeah. lose or win, it's it's like always going to be a story. And I mean the lawsuit. Oh, you, you said lawsuit. You didn't lawsuit. say yeah 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah with the lawsuit or you know anything like that. But the point I was going to make that goes back to this classical stuff is there are two classical chess tournaments that the general public cares about, and they are the World Championship and the candidates, and nothing else matters at all. Tata Steel is very close because it's. Magnus, Magnus, you. Yeah. I thought Hikaru was going to play. I guess not. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and Magnus only plays because he likes the tournament. Because if you look at the prize, it's like ten grand for his prize. Of course, players get some appearance fee. But for him, it's not a big prize money event. It's Chess Global Championship, two hundred grand for yeah, his prize. Yeah, right? Which, by the way, like people don't realize, Tata Steel is like absurd. You guys get like paid to show up, basically. And uh, I guess there's some sort of like prize fund secretly. But that's. Nobody cares about that. I don't that. think it's a big secret. Like first prize is ten grand. That's that's the first prize. Yeah, like I, I didn't even know that. See, I don't like know that. if it's like <laughs> if they advertise they it, but it's kind of it's sort of known. It's not like yeah, a secret. Right, but that's crazy as a prize fund for you know yeah, the best players in the world. Lot. I mean, it's, it's the old system. I mean, it, but and that's this is not a knock on like the the organizers there. It's just if you think about there are majors, grand slams. There's like tournaments for some of the best you know tennis players in the world. I mean, it's just a totally different ball game. The worst player on a team in basketball makes world championship level yeah. money. Yes, there are sponsors, TV deals, blah, 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 not a fair comparison, I understand. But if we're gonna get on TV, I don't think it's ever gonna be with classical chess. It's just, I, I just don't see it. I don't know how you can market it in a way that makes it, how do you watch that? How do you watch that in a sports bar? How do you watch that? Unless you're like a real true and tried chess fan. And then ultimately, like, how do you monetize that? Because that's the only way top guys are gonna make more money. Yeah. yeah, but on their hand, maybe it's about stakes because people watch the World Championship not because they want to watch one yes. game. Nobody yes. cares that it's, yeah. you know, whoever's playing. Like, let's say it's going to be Ding against uh, Jan, mm -hmm. and if it was just some match, mm -hmm. nobody will watch that. Yeah. Nobody's going to watch one game, one classical game a day. Suddenly it's a World Championship, people watch, even if Magnus or Hikaru or whoever yeah. the most popular chess player is. I'm very curious to playing. see, by the way, how it's going to do. Yeah, I still no think enough. just because it's World Championship and it has that weight. Yeah. And. If you totally get rid of classical chess, you get rid of that infrastructure. Yeah. Like FIDE has that, it's very valuable. Mm -hmm. They have the world championship. 
chess.com just can't recreate that. They can call it the chess global championship, but it has it doesn't have the same weight to it. Yeah. No, I I agree. I agree. I'm What's the ideal time control in your opinion that will help us get uh, chess on TV? It's got to be it like rapid it's blitz, 10 or bullet, 15 minutes. I mean, it's, yeah, it's naturally it's blitz too, of course. With or without increment? I think I think with is fine. With without uh, it, it that doesn't really make a difference. It just has to be like like again, there has to be things at stake. Prize fund, but also in the game itself. Like nobody can really truly watch a live chess event for six hours. I mean, they, the they hardcore can't. fans can. Right. Yeah. But that's, but that's very few people. Yeah. And you can't monitor. Like at the end of the day, when you're submitting to a sponsor, you have your KPIs of, you know, your. Uh, Key performance indicators, <laughs> chat, uh, in case you know, and, and like you say, oh look how many like viewers we had. CGC is going to destroy even the world championship probably. You could say peak viewers, mm -hmm. total viewers, but a, a good like live event. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the CGC was huge. I mean, the viewership was huge. It, the only thing I've seen bigger was the world championship last year, where we had the game six like across all platforms. Who knows, like quarter of a million people watching. Yeah, yeah, something like that. But CGC was really impressive in the numbers game, as well. Game six, in my recap, hit, I think, 100,000 views in an hour. Yeah, wow. that's insane. Which is... It's, it's ridiculous. It was number one for a while, and then the Magnus Hans thing happened. Yeah. And I think <laughs> they caught up. But that video got a million views in a week. And it's still, like, in many people, I get comments to this day. Like, I watched this for the fourth time today. Because the whole recap was just so epic. Yeah. And I remember I was exhausted that day. Everybody was exhausted. I mean, the players were exhausted. I canceled, like, four plans that day. I had, like, different things I was trying to do. And you I still... You have to watch it. Yeah? You have to watch it. You have to watch it. And, and, yeah, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of work went into that recap. Because during the World Championship, I would watch, like, five broadcasts at the same time and just absorb everyone's ideas. And then I would just like present them in the recap, not like as my own. I would say like, oh, here, you know, this person, it's like a fuck ton of work, right? It's not like, hello, everyone, you know, I'm just, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm obviously like, I'm, I'm messing around a little bit. And like, everybody has their sort of preference for who they go to. Like myself, I got mother, but uh, I would put in like, I watched all the, game, all the games start to finish. Like I couldn't take two hours off because I would miss a bunch of. Especially with a game like that, because you want to be honest with your audience and you have to present it as a hugely complex battle you can't yeah, be like yeah. this is a simple thing that you know and this this has happened and, and storyline and i mean the the i think the average watch time of that recap i think it's like 35 minute or 38 minute video is like 20 minutes which is nuts mm -hmm. that people watch that long and you slap five mid-roll ads on that 70 yeah. percent of uh, of the whole video yeah that's huge yeah, and it, it's 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 likely more. It gets weighed down by people who just tune in for a minute and then yeah, leave. And then they leave. People just put it on their Chromecast. So what's your ideal, let's say you're the leader of the chess world, what's your ideal tournament format to bring in the sponsors, to bring in the money and the viewership and all the everything that you need? It's, I mean, it's it's probably just some mix of, I mean, Speed Chess Championship, CGC. It's got to be live. It has to be at an arena. We have to figure out, like, noise cancellation <laughs> and, like, sound stuff, and maybe we, like, cage the players like you know there's a glass wall or whatever but uh that would be i mean that would be that would be the best thing and you get some massive title sponsor and but it's not easy and i don't know how this sort of stuff works in terms of outreach to companies like i don't have a manager i've like managed i have agents who like manage some of my sponsorships and they bring me stuff but i don't like nobody books my flights for me like nobody you know reaches out to i, I kind of have to learn that stuff on my own do you need like, fide for that because fide has you know, people think, okay, it's mostly chess.com now and they're creating all the events, but FIDE has federations, they have the rating system, and people put a lot of weight into that. When we say number two in the world, we don't think number two chess.com rating, number two chess24 rating, we think Ding, because he's number two FIDE rating. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, like, I think if I, if I pulled my audience on YouTube, I said, who's the second be best chess player in the world, FIDE Classical? You're going to be like 10, 10 for 10, 50 percent, maybe 15 percent, like immediately would just know it's ding. Mm. Uh, the rest it, would think. Who? No, it's like, no, they wouldn't know. They might just guess. They would just guess. Hikaru. They're going to say Hikaru just because they know Hikaru. Well, they yeah. might think Hikaru's number one, too. Uh, everybody knows Magnus, right? I, I mean, think. some people, I run into people on the street who, who ask me things that happened like four months ago. They mentioned things in the chess world that happened months ago. Like some guy we were into, I was like walking with, with Lucy and he's like, oh, it's your girlfriend, right? Like, we got married a year ago. <laughs> I mean, like people just, they tune in a little bit, they come back out. Like we don't realize, I don't realize, I have 1.8 million subscribers. That's like a country of people. That's yeah. so many people. And uh, last year, my videos were recommended to people five and a half billion times. 
recommend it. And yeah. they click like 3% of them and that's where the view, I mean, that's like the world population. It's not exactly the same. You watch like YouTube for an hour, you're gonna get all my stuff. Like, but we don't realize like how many people there are that just watch chess a little bit. Like, oh shit, I haven't played in a while. Or like they're scrolling on their page, they haven't played in a few months and they get like a clip of Stockfish playing some other bot and just destroying its 30 second clip. And they're like, oh. This was, this was a revelation for me. It was like, let's say a year ago mm -hmm. uh, or a bit more than that. I realized, I was like, okay, everyone knows Magnus, everyone knows Vichy, everyone knows Gary, Kramnik. I realized, no, this is not how the majority of the chess world sees it now. It's, they know the small bits that they got exposed mm -hmm. to. And it's totally random. It's not, they know, it's not like everyone knows Hikaru and Magnus. It's like, everyone knows Hikaru. Some people don't know Magnus. Some people don't know Hikaru. Some people think Prognanta. You know, they, it's just whatever they see. And uh, I only realized that recently because I, it was, the chess world changed so much so rapidly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, I mean, I, I don't think people even know Kasparov or Vichy. Like the yeah, which that's, is, that's, which we're is getting so, there. We're getting there. Which is yeah. so wild. Which is, which is so wild. There's a huge Indian uh, skew for like Vichy and some mm -hmm. of those like great players. But if I just ran into a guy and I, you know, on the street and I was like, oh, did you see Prague? Be like, I don't know who that is. Like, this is like, this was like the video that, that you had, uh, you know, with Danny, right? Mm -hmm. In New York. Uh, it was New York, right? Yeah, yeah. The guy was like, oh, you're Danny Wrench. He didn't know who I was. Yeah, it's like, it's fuck? so random. It's like so that, random. That actually blows my mind because like, if you know Danny, you are in some way involved in the chess world. You you're saying exposed. there's no trickle down yeah. effect. Because maybe he just saw the Hans stuff mm -hmm. and then he saw, okay, Danny, Danny Wrench, and Rossi, Hans, yeah. chess star, and, and you're, not, you're not being sued. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't, <laughs> <That's>, right. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I, I've been, like, I've walked with with Eric Rosen, like we ran into, like a guy will run into us and he knows both of us. Or there'll be a moment he's like, oh, what's up, Levy? And I'm like, do you know who this is? Mm. And the guy's like, oh, oh, I think so. <laughs> and it's just like interesting. Yeah, there's just people who, um, we had this in the CVS in Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy like was super hard pressed <laughs> and he called him Naraditsky. <laughs> he called no, him it was yeah, very yeah. funny. I, I was with, uh, like, saying next to Anish. Yeah, he knew and Anish. knew Anish instantly. He's like, from Twitter. I know you too. Oh, from Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, he yeah, was like, yeah. Anish from Twitter, yeah. And we were like, okay, so guess. And he was like, Der Naroditsky? And it was funny because Naroditsky is like, let's say, 6'3. Yeah. Very similar. Yeah, but I mean, I'm half a foot shorter than him, <laughs> maybe. Maybe a bit less than half a foot, but, you know. Once you see us side by side, you're not going to make a mistake. But that's the thing, they don't see you side by side. They only see the face on the computer. That's, yeah, that's, that's true, that's true. Um, but it was very funny, I was like, really? And height is one of Maybe the things that's mostly discussed, yeah, about influencers in general. They're like, okay, how tall is that guy? How tall is that guy? Yeah, you don't like to compare it. You don't realize people's height at all, like until, that's un the thing. Yeah, yeah. Un until you see them. Uh, and and even even then sometimes like even now I was I was at the venue I'm like seeing some of these streamers I'm like these are real people I, I still go through that <laughs> yeah. I, like I experienced that with Lex I was like this is a real person this is so weird you know what I mean like I I've watched these people on on the screen so much and uh, I don't really have these moments where I'm like oh my god but I've I've had that in the past and uh, I think that's an important realization for the internet as a whole because. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> when when you're making comments to people, you have to realize that you're not you're not throwing some something out there which will get lost in the wind. It might reach a person, it might you know affect the person, um, but it's very easy not to notice, realize, or even care mm -hmm. until it's like face to face. You know, otherwise you're just a face on a screen, right? Um, but yeah, that's that's one of the challenges, I guess, about the internet as a whole. It's very easy to not make it personal. No, it's yeah, it's it, crazy. Like to look at something just as this is a thing I interact with and makes me laugh, and this is not a real human being. And uh, it it's a good advice. Realize that people are act like they're they're real, and uh, you should you should treat them as such. And I've even had to coach teenagers out of interactions in in some of my Twitch streams. They say some crazy stuff, and I go like, "Can you imagine saying this to someone like in, mm. in person?" You get punched in the face. Yeah. Yeah, I, I let them finish the last part of that <laughs> sentence. You know how it's gonna end, but uh, it's like, yeah, like, don't do that, man. Like, don't 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 talk to people that way. That's an it's like an interesting social thing. Like generally, it's you know you you make some comment, and in the past, you you when we didn't have an mm -hmm. internet or a way to say something to someone not face-to-face, -face, maybe on the phone, 
uh, you'd have to think about the repercussions of this, you know? No, I haven't. And, yeah, yeah, no, sorry. And now it's like, uh, yeah, I'll say this, and they won't even know who I am, right? It could be anonymous as well. I made this joke to, to Danny uh, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you don't know where I am usually. I'm just in my house, and we were at the hotel in, in Toronto, and there were moments where in some of my, like, I, I don't even know how I remembered, like, discovering this, but some, somebody mentioned that they were from Canada, uh, and they also mentioned, like, in the same, I don't know, paragraph or something, something, like, really heinous about myself. Like, I, I don't even remember what. And I, and I remember just being like, well, you know where I am? Like, come say it to my face. Mm. Like, come on. like, I really, I just got this, like, instinct, just like... The oh, rush. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I've actually, I've told this story on stream before. I have, um, I've been two times, I've never been in a fight. Have you guys ever been in fights? Like, physical fights? Just sparring. As like a just kid, barred. a few times, but yeah, long never. Long. Only yeah. as a only as a kid. I was like nine once, and like oh no, I was eleven actually, and then like I got in a little fight. I was a small, eleven year old, got in a little fight, got like. Actually, I think Eric Hansen punched me in the face once. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, by mistake. By mistake. By mistake. Okay, we were well, this, this was deliberate. You see, I was uh, I was wrestling this little kid to the ground. He like socked me once, but I actually had like this kind of situation. I was like eleven or twelve, and this kid was like fourteen, fifteen. He was friends with my stepbrother, and we were playing Maple Story, like video game. Whatever, like fun game, you know, you, you like you hang out with your friends. He was like he was like being an asshole to me. I remember he was like nice kid, like I don't remember, he's being like bullying me online. Yeah. And I have like a stepbrother who's much bigger. And I that made me feel confident. So I was like, yo, I know where you live. Like you live across the street from my stepbrother. Like, next time I'm there, I'm gonna go to your house. Like, don't get like and I'm like twelve, you know, I don't know what that means. <laughs> right, right, right. So uh, next time we're there, like hanging out with my stepbrother's family, having like dinner, you know, uh, and, and I say, Oh, like I'm gonna go stop by his house. <laughs> And uh, and I and I go and I, and I knock on his door and you know somebody like dad mom open up they're like who What's are you <laughs> and I'm like hey is you know is blank home and they're like yeah it's like the whole family's in the living room it's like mom dad sister cousin like five people and I realize I, I don't know what I'm doing like you know I'm like a <laughs> little kid like trying to fight what am I supposed to do now yeah, yeah and I and I said is he there and and they're like. Who are you? I'm like, I'm his friend. They call him. He like comes down the stairs and he looks. And I'm looking. I'm like, I don't really think this through, huh? He's like, what? I'm like, you want to like step outside and talk? Like, by the way, for the record, he could have like whooped my ass. Like, I don't even know. I was just super confident that I was like, gonna, you know, we we're like the same size or whatever. I'm like, he talked mad shit. And I said, you want to step outside? And he just went, no. <laughs> and I just never, like that didn't occur to me. Like I didn't think that one through at all. And I was, like, we just had a very awkward, painful moment. I walked away and I was like, yeah, he was... He didn't step outside. I won that. Yeah. yeah. And I had like a kind of a similar thing in high school where it's like you're going to like fight somebody, but it doesn't really happen. But that was like this literally. This is how we realize what you can't do. Like, yeah. This is, you grow up and you realize this is. I, I had like a sim, similar thing in sixth grade. And I went to a school, you know, part of New York, which was like a little bit rough. Um, and there's this kid, Patrick, and he's selling Yu Gi Oh cards. Okay. That was his thing. And he was like a small kid. He was like me. I was also small. And I like started dissing him for playing with Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And he took this like very seriously. And I didn't realize that he had two friends who were eighth graders and they were really big. And so I, then I heard that they're going to come after me. Mm -hmm. And I spent, I had like sleepless nights. I was like, what the fuck do I do to get out of this? <laughs> yep. Like tomorrow could be my last day on earth, you know? And they eventually like, just stole my backpack and put it in a toilet stall because I guess we're kids and what what the fuck do kids do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, the my high school version of this is like I, long story short, like me and this dude like put a date and a time we were gonna fight, like behind the library, and uh, we like polled who was gonna be on like whose team in the whole grade. We had like fifty like, people per side, and my mom one day overheard me on the phone talking to my friend. And uh, either my mom or my grandmother like silently called the school and said, don't let a 50 on 50 fight break out. I'm not trying to have my son go to like jail for gang in, in, in violence or something. But when you're a teenager, you don't, you're not, there's no, I mean, your brain functions completely differently. And yeah, like you look back at some of the stuff like, wow, I'm pretty thankful that didn't go through or and like, ah, that was a, that was a close call. <laughs> and I think you have to have these experiences. Cause if you, if you get in your twenties and thirties, you like, don't have these like really tense, like scary moments in your life. You're going to have to do all this learning now. And, and when it's dangerous, right? I mean, yeah, if you, now if you do that when in your twenties, you don't, people are you know, far more unhinged. You don't get a break. Yeah, yeah. You don't have a mom to call the guidance counselor. You don't have, I have yeah, very, very, very similar thing. Yeah. It's, um, Levy, I wanted to speak to you about, uh, 
you as a teacher as well. You have a new platform coming up. Tell us a bit about that. Is, uh, yeah, is it yeah. teaching based? What, what it's, is it it's, it's just, I mean, it's just my courses. Like I have, I mean, it's essentially my, the courses that I always had, uh, but I was hosting them on like a courses hosting platform. Yeah. There's a lot of those. You could sell literally anything. You could, sewing is, I don't know. Uh, trading is like a very popular one because you can sell a very expensive course on how to make money on the stock market. Yeah. And, it might actually work. I mean, you just, you know, you're not really, you're reinventing the wheel kind of on some of the stuff, but, uh, and people liked it and it was good, but w the problem was it was 15 chapters of video and then you could download the PGN and like do whatever you want. That was another thing, super antiquated. Like nobody knew what the fuck a PGN was mm -hmm. when they got into the chess world and they had to learn. There was no way to, there was no way around it. Um, this is like another question of infrastructure because we, we got used to chess base, right? They, mm -hmm. they like monopolized the yeah. chess software market. And now, okay, chessable is sort of yeah. a thing as well, but to break into that is difficult. It's also very easy to pirate anything yeah. regarding a PGN and uh, and video. So, and and we we kind of felt like like I have a friend of mine from high school who kind of was like, you know, there's stuff missing here, and we can make like a really valuable product. So he essentially just quit his job. He was working like full time um, as an engineer, and we we built my courses, but like much better. Um, I, I don't have any plans to essentially become a chessable. Like they, they, they do what they do, uh, but we're building a bunch of like very cool training games from scratch. Uh, again, kind of applying the, the, the philosophy like, okay, what does a YouTube viewer want to see? Like what does an 1100 actually, how, how do they get better at chess? And uh, we're Are working on- Are people going to uh, be able to create on the platform? Other people? Other people, yeah. Maybe in the long run, but like I said, like I'm not trying to, that's essentially chessable. Yeah. Right. And uh, the thing is, the I, I am selling something completely different than a lifetime repertoire, Knight of Sicilian by Anish Giri. Like that is a bulletproof, outstanding course that I don't think is applicable to 99% of my audience. Yeah. It's like a completely different thing. In fact, like I would I would go so far as to say those, those like th some of those rating barriers that they put, you know, like this is good for 1400. So I, no, it's not like there is I have bought some chessable courses. And I learn like 15 lines and that is what I need because everybody at 2400 plays that. Yeah. Nobody's going to play anything of any of their stuff. Like it's good to know and you need to know the sidelines and everything. And that's not to say it's, it's not a good product. It's a very good product and you can train it, but it's totally different than my target audience. Like at 16, 1700 over the board, I sort of hand you off to Naraditsky. Yeah. Uh, so, so what do you tell people when, because I get this question a lot, like I'm stuck at this level, how do mm -hmm. I improve? What do you tell someone who is like, I'm stuck at 1600. How do I make the next step? Well, online, it's kind of, it's okay. like you, I actually did a video on this recently. I like took a bunch of accounts and I analyzed them. Like I look at their statistics with white, black. Then I would play through their openings with white and with black. It's like very easy to find through opening tree. Just people just completely don't know. Like they're fake studying. Mm -hmm. They buy courses. They don't know the courses at all. They think, oh, I'm like buying a course. So like you don't know anything. You make mistakes, like move f f like five or six, which is like one of the benefits of the drills now on Chesley will be, you know, you can, drill it down and the woodpecker method or yeah we don't we don't have well we don't have that like we we might add that in the future where it only throws things your way that we see that you're struggling at but we don't have that capability we have a team of like three developers at the moment mm. but uh like that's important and so in the very beginning people are like oh this is basically chess well, i'm like no this is just one of the ways to train like a drill but you also have like flashcards, like move eight you just get a position on like i don't know what, what chapter this is in yeah, yeah. It's like things like that. I mean, you know, flashcard style learning. Have, um, have you consulted with people outside of chess who, let's say, specialize in how to memorize things or no, tools of that nature? No, the most we're going to do outside of the world of chess is um, mostly on the side of like design, marketing, making like the cleanest sales funnel possible, you know, like the parts of the website to actually subconsciously sort of convince people that this is something worth mm -hmm. doing as opposed to kind of like the, the chest itself, but it's definitely, I mean, I'm totally open to it. I, I just meant for like research in terms of yeah, like how to like a product, you know, how to figure out like where people are struggling and how to improve that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's definitely on the table in the future. I mean, one of the things I'm building now, like I haven't made a new course in a super long time because the old site was very tough to, there's no, only so many ways you can repackage gambits or fucking, you know, like all this stuff. So I made a middle games course that's going to be like 50 or 60 like lessons 
and then 200, 250 like handpicked exercise. Like I went through a thousand of my chess.com games and just found an example of pawn play, mm. like a sophisticated example of like in a game like pawn play or converting a winning position mm -hmm. or the lag thereof. Like how did I mess up? Like recognizing and totally programmed around like a massive poll I did of intermediate players. So uh, what, where do they struggle? Making a plan. So they don't know what the fuck that means. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I have to kind of like present that to them. It can be like a two or three move little sequence or sort of, okay, here's three different options. So you decide like which of these is, is, is better. And then, you know, that kind of thought process of coming back or converting a winning position. You got to figure that out. Like as a, as a player, you got to realize like how or recognizing an opponent's resource while you're trying to convert a position or defending. Like people don't know the different ways of defending and what they should be looking for and like avoiding tunnel vision. And um, Do you think like the classic tools, the classic chess training tools, like let's say Kodov's Think Like a Grandmaster, or the tree of analysis, all this stuff, do you think that's still helpful or is it outdated? Is that just not gonna help the average chess player now? I, I think it works for people that like they, they, that's the way they enjoy learning. I mean, some people really hate digital products. I can't help like those people. Um, I am writing a book which is gonna be pretty crazy uh, to, to publish. And it's, that'll kind of be like the final circle of, cause I don't have any print stuff. Mm -hmm. And somebody came to me with an idea, like why don't you apply all the ways you teach chess and have taught it to like young people, um, young kids in a book. So we're making essentially a chess book that will take you from like zero, like absolute zero in the beginning, the intro is sort of like the basics uh, to like a, around 11, 1200. And it's really hard cause it, it's like the book. Mm. Like the goal was that you can read that book before bed. You don't need a chessboard. It's like tons of diagrams in that? it. How do you do that? Is the question. It took a long time. Uh, mm. And also at the end of every chapter, there's QR codes that will link you to like a free extension of the book and you can practice stuff. That's so if like, cool. yeah, I end a chapter on like white pieces. I'm not gonna show you 30 moves of theory, but I'm gonna give you general overview and principle and then you can use the QR code and you can actually play out on like a dynamic board. PGN kind of viewer stuff. type of thing. Yeah, but see like not, not PGN viewer. <laughs> not like PGN it's viewer, like, it's, yeah. it's uh, but yes, that's, we actually built the board like on a separate language from PGN. Really? Which wow. has pluses and minuses. The, the minus is you cannot just import bulk PGN, which is what the chess world is used to, but it's like very lean. PGN apparently in coding is a humongous language. Uh, whereas like the way we built the moves to be registered is super, super lean. I can't understand it because I, I, I don't code. But why is that such a big advantage? Um, I, I think it's like, it's easier to build the site. Like the site Servers. is faster, okay. Servers, everything is probably, faster. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, unfortunately, yes, the byproduct is a lot more like you can't import nine chess based chapters. You kind of have to import like the line and then do a little bit more work. So it's. It feels like you're trying to reinvent the chess world in some in some small ways. Like you're trying to rethink how we do things in the chess world. Is that something that you? Yes, done? yes. But I I think it's mostly again it, it's mostly for my audience. Like I haven't extended it to two thousand rated players. Like still as a two thousand, you get tremendous benefit from a really long course chess base. Yeah. And the way you're kind of supposed to study, like the way I would study. Like I yeah. wouldn't really study with all these training games I'm making mm -hmm. for like the vast majority, not even vast majority, like 95, like I said, 95% of players, uh, they can benefit from things like that, from things like um, you have a position, it's called like, we named it flash memory. You show a position, you click like start. How many squares did the knight on D4 control? It's like all the board is blank now, mm -hmm. like things like that. I mean, I, I don't need that, but a huge amount of people do, or like visualization practice, or you set yourself a timer and you have to play a move that keeps the advantage within 75% of the top move. So like, you just hmm. have, it's like managing your time. That's very interesting. Like, yeah. you just have to make a move, just go, just keep the balance. Like, don't blunder anything terrible. Like, these are all just ways that players struggle because they These tank. are completely new tools though. Yeah. That you design. I didn't design, but I, like we, I mean, my team, I, we, we like constantly brainstorm. Like we're gonna probably do something in the future for counterplay, but we always have to sit down and brainstorm what does that look like? And like, when does a user know there's counterplay? So you first have to maybe select, like, is there counterplay in this position? Do you have a move? Because a lot of tactics is, you know, a lot of this puzzle solving stuff is like, there is a move. But there's Did never- you take inspiration from other games? No. For uh, these tools? No. Uh, it's kind of like the same thing as uh, just the whole YouTube and Twitch thing. I, it, hmm. it, like, I, I really enjoy sitting and like thinking and, and trying to b break things that currently exist. And it's a lot easier for me to do it in chess because I understand so much about it. 
But even when I walk down the street, I like very frequently, I'm like, that is really stupid and outdated. I'm just not smart enough to do anything about it. Um, but that's it, always sort of been my... It's an interesting subject in chess because the way I learn chess and probably the way you guys both learn chess is, you know, you sit down with a book and you, mm -hmm. you read through it and, you know, get a lesson with the chess coach on the board. And everything's very slow and it takes a very certain, very specific type of personality to be ready to do that, right? It's... And maybe like the way to get people most interested in chess is to gamify it a bit. To, yeah. To make it we more don't interactive. We do that uh, attention span anymore. We lost that. Well, that I, patience, I think we lost it as, and the new generation is like so fast paced nowadays. Yeah, that's why, and well, that's why you would yeah, make that's, games that's out why of it. Help. You, yeah. Would, yeah, you have to gamify everything yeah. nowadays. And I, I don't know about the whole like point system thing, but I, I, the more I'm thinking about it, Again, I was trying to like stay away from this. Well, I'm 1800. I already have like two chessables. I'm like 10 million rubies I have in my account. Like, why would I do? And I was like, okay, like you don't have to. I'm not convincing you. Like, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, but I was trying to stay away from like the whole points leaderboard thing. But yeah, I'm realizing that that makes it fun for people. Like people want that yeah. stuff. They want some sort of like reward, like to come back and. Like if um, if I'm doing anything besides chess, like some sort of game, and most people will regard chess as just like a fun diversion, the way mm -hmm. I regard maybe some game as a fun diversion, is I, I want to see something mm -hmm. concrete. I yeah. want to have some points or whatever. I don't want to be like, oh, I think I'm better and maybe in a few months it will show. That's mm -hmm. not very fun for anyone, right? For chess players, it's like that's normal, right? You, yeah. you know, you, you, don't, you don't see your improvement except maybe like a few months down the road, you increase your rating by 20 points. But that's not going to attract the majority of people. No. Levy, I mean, we could probably be sitting here and talk for two more hours. Yeah, it's but true. I should tell my wife good night. <laughs> it's like 11 o'clock. <laughs> we are going to have a part two for sure with you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll leave it at this. And uh, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow at the chess boxing event. Yeah, sounds good, guys. Right. Thanks, Levy.